He awoke with a start. There were sounds of footsteps clambering down the hallway outside of his, his bedroom, the sounds of soldiers' feet marching. He, he got out of bed and, and looked through the crack between the door and, and, and the wall and saw the soldiers coming and priests and sinister looks on their face in long flowing robes chanting. He heard the, the crash on the door of his, uh, the, the pounding on the door of his half brother's room right down the hall. He heard her, his, his half brother's mother screaming, no, no, not my son. And then he heard the shrieks of terror coming from his brother who was just a little bit older than him and watched through the crack as the soldiers pulled him out, his mother grabbing at, at, at them and they pushed her back to the room and the priest grabbed the boy and began marching down the hall through the palace grounds. He watched as he exited the palace gates out the window and walked down the road toward the valley of Hinnom. He could hear the drums beating in the distance. He could see the glow of the fire, the crowd already beginning to assemble before dawn in the valley of Hinnom where a giant sinister idol stood, the god, demon god, small g, called Molech. And this giant statue sat with a, with a, with a burning furnace underneath and a cauldron, a burning furnace that would, they would stoke very, very hot, this fire burning with arms outstretched, waiting for children to be placed into the arms where they would roll down into the fire to be sacrificed to this demon god, Molech. He heard as the crowds, the chants of the, the crowd and the drums got louder and louder, and he knew what was about ready to happen and all he could do was crawl back in bed pull his head his blanket over his head and Hezekiah cried and cried and wondered am I next that was the scene in Jerusalem in about 740 BC during the time of the ministry of the prophet Isaiah who begins his book, his prophecies, like this. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1. It says this, The vision concerning Judah in Jerusalem that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Now, if you don't know a lot about the, the nation of Israel and the history of the nation of Israel, it's the land that God promised to Abraham thousands of years ago. And then, and then God raised up and incubated a nation, a family that turned into a nation in Egypt and delivered them through the Red Sea miraculously, brought them into the promised land, the land uh, that we know as Israel. And a couple hundred years later, they begin to have kings, Saul, David, the most famous, and Solomon, the wealthiest. And that is at the pinnacle of the size and the influence of the, um, the nation of Israel. But Solomon, late in his life, abandons God. He allows his wives to draw his lots of wives. I remember from our series through Ecclesiastes um, to draw his heart towards idolatry. He abandons God late in life, and the nation, right after his rule, is split. You have the kingdom of Israel in the north, takes the name of the nation, ten tribes to the north, and they go off on their own and find their own king, and actually the first thing the king does is create two golden calves that will serve as their God and a new place to worship, a new temple. Now, if you've read through, you know, the first five books, Exodus, you know that's not a good thing. That's not a good thing, right? And um, so God, uh, in the, the upper nation, the, the kingdom of Judah and the southern kingdom of Israel, or the, the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah is two tribes, tribe of Judah and one other tribe. And they have Jerusalem. They have Jerusalem. They have the temple. They have the priests. And what you begin to see in the northern kingdom is very, very quickly, they abandon God. They have a string of awful, evil, wicked kings, including characters like Ahab and Jezebel. 
They abandoned God. And thousand, about seven, 800 years before this, uh, God had warned them as he was bringing them at Mount Sinai that I'm giving you this covenant. I'm giving you the law, the covenant. I'm bringing you to the promised land. But if when you get to that land, if you abandon me and go after all the practices of the nations around, you will be exiled. You will be removed from this nation. I brought you into this world, and I can take you out of it. Some of you had parents that said that when they were kind of ticked off, right? I brought you in. I can take you out. God essentially said that. He makes a promise, a promise, that if you abandon me and go after idolatry and the detestable, he calls them detestable practices of these nations in the, in, in, that inhabited the promised land before you, you will be exiled. You will be removed. And so we see the string of names in, I, in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1. We see Uzziah. He, he had a good start. See, Isaiah, whose name means Yahweh, the one true God, the revealed name of God, is salvation. He ministered during all, the reigns of all these different kings. And uh, Uzziah had a good start, but we're told in the scripture, when he became powerful, his pride destroyed him, and he became unfaithful to the Lord his God. It's an important lesson. Jotham, he actually did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but we're told that nevertheless, the people continued in their corrupt ways. So we're talking about kings in the southern kingdom now, where Isaiah is ministering. The people continued in their corrupt ways. Ahaz, Ahaz, man, this was Hezekiah's father. He, he burned, we're told he burned sacrifices in the valley of Ben-Hinnom and sacrificed his son, Hezekiah's half-brother probably, by burning him alive. And we're told this is one of the disgusting things done by the nations that the Lord had forced out of the Israelites' way. We're also told that in, he took things from the temple and divided it up and made little altars all over the city of Jerusalem. He made places to wor worship, to sacrifice to other gods. Unheard of. And he made the one true God very angry. This was a time during Ahaz's reign of war and political ten tension. One day, in one day, as the neighbors were attacking from, from the east, 120,000 soldiers from Judah were killed. It was during this time, during Ahaz's reign, in 722 B.C., that, that this map here, the Assyrian kingdom, which had been growing and growing in power, finally comes over and fully takes over Israel and hauls them out into exile like God had promised seven to 800 years before this. Never to return. In ancient history. So it's a time of, of tension, of constant threats, of, of political intrigue, of fear, of as they walked away from the trust in the God. I, I, I think some of the stuff leading to that sacrificing children is the priest saying, you got to do this in order to earn the favor of this God so he'll help protect you instead of turning to the one true God. In fact, they begin to turn towards alliances and make alliances with, with Egypt and all this just keeps backfiring on Ahaz. And Hezekiah, the young boy whose brother was sacrificed, he grows up and he becomes king. And he actually did what the Lord considered right. He was a righteous king. He did during this period of time more than any of these other kings um, to, to bring a time of, of worship of the one true God to destroy the idols and the, and the temples and the high places, these places on hills where they would sacrifice and do all sorts of immorality and different things. In fact, he, he's friends with Isaiah, and at one point, um, as, as Assyria is coming down to attack them and try to take over, they take over the town, the big Lachish, the town nearby, and they set up siege works against Jerusalem. And Hezekiah calls out to God, and Isaiah prays to the Lord, and the Lord delivers them. In fact, it's really interesting because we can go back and read uh, non-biblical history from the Assyrians, from their historical records, and there's this really interesting incident here. We know how they take over, but during this siege, for some reason, the king just says, oh, I had stuff to do back home. So we went back home. See, king, ancient kings never wrote stuff that made themselves look bad. So he's like, I just had stuff. I was busy back home. I got to go take care of some business. But the Bible tells us what actually happened 
is when Hezekiah and Isaiah called out to the Lord, the Lord delivered them in one night. The angel of the Lord, we're told, came and wiped out the Assyrian army in an act of God. And that's the true history behind this little blank spot in the secular history that the king would just as soon forget about, not have anybody know about. Now, Hezekiah, even though his heart was for the Lord, he did so many good things. Um, you, you get this picture from, from Kings and Chronicles in the Bible that at the end of his life, it wasn't that he abandoned God and went after idols, but he just kind of checked out. He wasn't so passionate about his relationship with the Lord. During this time, he has a son. His son Manasseh is, is, is born. And you kind of get this picture of a guy who probably isn't pouring into and discipling his son and speaking truth in life. Deuteronomy 6, talking about the things of God all the time, passing on his passion for God. And Manasseh grows up to be an evil, 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 wicked man. In fact, Jewish tradition tells us that it was him who sawed Isaiah the prophet in two. It's interesting, in Hebrews 11, it's known as the Hall of Fame of Faith, and there's this little thing, all the, all the heroic stories, the ones we like of, you know, the people who turn and follow God, and it went great for them, and, you know, they died at a ripe old age after a great life, and then it goes, and then there were others that were also part of the Hall of Fame of Faith, great saints of old, and some of them lived in caves, and they ran away and were sawed in two. And, and scholars think that perhaps Isaiah the prophet was one of those sought into, mentioned in the hall of fame of faith. So it was an incredible time of uncertainty, conflict, and chaos. And even though the story I, I opened with of, of Hezekiah's brother being torn away and sacrificed to the, the demon idol Molech, even though it's so foreign and hard for us to identify with, I think we can identify a little bit with a world full of chaos and uncertainty and a world indifferent to God that turns away from God. Man, uncertainty and conflict, we're, we're sure seeing a lot of that. This week was one month since the barbaric attack of Hamas that killed 1,400 people and things so barbaric, we can't really, you know, with kids in the room, we don't even want to really describe them, right? This would have been equivalent in the U.S. if this was 9-11 to 30, 37,000 people being killed if you adjusted it for population, but not just killed. Some of their tortures being live streamed to family members. Barbaric, awful things. And our news cycle has moved so fast that it's almost like that's ancient history, we forgot what precipitated the current like conflict, right? But what we've been seeing now are some of the largest sustained demonstrations in history around the world. Yesterday on Veterans Day, tearing down not just the Israeli flag, but the American flag. Crowds chanting, swastikas appearing. Stuff that like, <laughs> this stuff would have been like so shocking just a little while ago. We're hearing crowds chant from the river to the sea. What does that mean when you hear that? It's chanting for the complete annihilation of Israel, the land that God promised to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and his descendants forever, the division of it. Now, I, I know a lot of, not everyone protesting has that heart. In fact, a lot of them, I don't even think they know what it means. I heard an interview with this Girl is like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> but that's what it means. And the division is tearing apart at the fabric of nations all around the world. Right now, we have the largest accumulation of U U.S. naval power in the history of the world in the Mediterranean. Retired generals are saying, eh, there's pieces in place for more than just a conflict in Gaza. Things are escalating. And we just watch and go, I wonder what's happening. We, we certainly identify with a nation indifferent to the instructions of God, whether it comes to the sanctity of human life, it comes to a nation walking away from what God says about um, how we live our lives, our moral lives before him, what we do with our bodies, our sexuality. And here's what we're going to see in, in the book of Isaiah. Three big themes we're going to look at today, judgment, redemption, and hope. 
judgment, redemption, and hope. Isaiah is known by scholars as the prince of prophets. That's because the book of Isaiah is so beautiful. It's a literary masterpiece. It's the most quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament. In fact, Jesus gets up from it and reads from Isaiah 61 at the launch of his ministry. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news. And he closes that out. When he closes it, he says, today, this very prophecy has been fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, 700 years ago, Isaiah wrote this about me and about this day. And guess what? They pick up stones and they try to kill him. Why? Because they understood he was claiming to be God. They saw this as blasphemy. Isaiah is given an incredible revelation of God in Isaiah chapter 6. And just a quick note, we're not going to preach verse by verse through the whole book of Isaiah. Some of you are wondering, we're launching a new book, and it's Isaiah. Wait a minute, aren't there 66 chapters in Isaiah? It took you two years to get through John. Just calm down. <laughs> we're, going to, we're going to be in the, bo in the book up through Christmas. And, but I'm hoping as we go through, I've, I've just been pouring over it, listening to it on audio, kind of on repeat. And uh, what I want to do is, as we go through this is take chunks of time and dive back into Isaiah as we explore other books down the road in the future. But he's given this incredible revelation of God in, in chapter 6 where in a prophetic vision he's in the throne room of God. And then he's given a commission, a tough task. He's given some tough prophetic tasks. In fact, uh, one of those is, um, see if you'd like this commission, this task from God. He had to go around barefoot and naked for like a couple of years as a prophetic act towards this people group that God says, you're going to be hauled off in shame with your buttocks showing. I said that in church. I'm quoting the Bible. It's in there. You should read it. It's really interesting. Um, <laughs> all, of sudden, all of in middle school, like kids perk up, right? We have this saying, guys really never get out of middle school. You know, it's pretty much true. I don't know, Fart, pull my finger jokes are still funny. I still laugh at that stuff. Uh, but that's in the Bible, so I hope you have some humor by 11 o'clock. Uh, but Isaiah is given the tough task of speaking to a rebellious nation, writing about 150, between about 150 and 120 years before Judah was hauled off by Babylon into exile as God had promised before this. So that's how he starts his book, and here's how he continues it. And today we're going to dive in a little bit to chapter one, but really this talk is just to set up the series, and, and this is our, our Advent series, okay? So how many of you decorated, you got your Christmas decorations up already? Yeah, you jumped the gun. So did my family. I tried to stop them. I protested. It didn't work. So we've got Christmas all over the house already, um, but you're going to be like, well, this isn't very Christmassy talk. You're right. You're right. But here's the thing. Here's what Isaiah does. In, he's given pro prophetic pictures of the future, some of events that are happening right now, right in this moment, in the year, the couple years to come, soon. Some that are written 120, 150 years from now when, Isaiah, when uh, the people will be hauled off into exile. Some a little bit later when he says, comfort, oh, comfort my people when they understand, guess what? There's hope. I'm going to bring a remnant back. And then some for 700 years later when Jesus would appear on the scene, the, some of the most clear writings in all of the Bible about the substitutionary atonement of Jesus. Isaiah 53, it's phenomenal. And then some that we're still waiting for, for the end of days, this beautiful picture of eternity. And, and oftentimes, have anybody ever climbed a mountain and you look at a peak and you see a peak and maybe a little peak behind there and it all looks close together? And then you climb to the one and you realize it was a false peak. Yeah, that, that was a peak. But the one you were really trying to get to, you got to go way down and way back up. I remember that from the San Juans. And then all of a sudden when you get up, you see the expanse of the peaks, how they go in the distance. And from Isaiah's perspective and from people in the Old Testament's perspective, um, these events seem close together. But what we understand as we begin to scale the peaks is he is seeing prophetic pictures throughout the course of history. Many that were still waiting. 
And so Advent, Advent, as we begin, you know, we'll really dive into this more as we get after Thanksgiving uh, and begin to talk about the birth of Jesus, the first Advent, the coming of Jesus Christ. But Advent, what Advent is really about is it's those valleys, it's the journey in between, the fact that he has come as anticipated, as expected, and he has promised to come again. And yet we go through this world of chaos and turmoil, waiting for him. But we have the hope that he accomplished what he already promised to assure us that he'll accomplish what he still promises. So that was a long preaching on verse 1, wasn't it? We'll make the rest of this a lot faster. Verse 2. Here's what he said. And the first thing we're going to see is the theme of a father's heart for his, for his people and then the promised judgment that he'd promised 800 years before it says this, hear me, you heavens. This is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah. Listen, earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its master and the donkey its owner's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Woe to the sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on him. Don't you get the cry of a father God, his heart broken as he looks at a rebellious child? He goes on, look, and, and let's catch the heart of the father here. Isn't this the heart of a father, a good father? Why should you be beaten anymore? Why do you persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured. Your whole heart is afflicted. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness. Only wounds and welts and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or, or soothed with oil. Your country is desolate. Your cities burned with fire. Your fields are being stripped by foreigners right before you, laid waste as when overthrown by strangers. And the first thing we really begin to see develop is the theme of a father God and the theme of, of a father with a heart for his people that's saying, why won't you return to me? You don't have to be in the condition you're in. And we see the theme of judgment. Now, sometimes judgment in scripture is active and sometimes it's passive. I think we can probably all think of somebody in our extended families or, or a friend that, that uh, man, people warned them, mom and dad, you know, tried to step in. Friends tried to say something, but they just kept going down the path and have suffered some terrible consequences along the way because of that. And your heart breaks for them. And sometimes judgment comes in the form of just passive consequences for sinful choices. The wages of sin is death. When Paul says that, it's not just an eternal thing. It's sin brings death in our lives. And I think we've, we've all, in a sense, experienced that in different areas of our life. And then sometimes God says um, judgment comes in the form of a God who's going to act and bring correction like he promised 800 years before. And if you keep going down this road, if you refuse to repent and to return, there will be a consequence. A God who acts through nations in the course of history. And that's part of what the, uh, the prophet Isaiah talks about is a God who is not passive, a God who is active, a God who speaks, and a God who acts. In fact, at the very end of the book, we see an example of that. In, in chapter 64, verse 1, here's what Isaiah says. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. There's this heart of saying, oh, God, oh, that you would act. As I look at the world, it's so broken. It's so corrupt. There's so much violence and chaos. God, would you act? And the testimony of Isaiah, both in fulfilled prophecy, is we have a God who acts in the course of history. Not always in our time. We don't understand sometimes the timing of God. He, he, as you notice, he doesn't consult you, you know, if he did, you'd be like, how about you get that done right now? He doesn't, he, he doesn't do that, right? He acts on his time, but he does act. Isaiah 64, four says this, since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God beside you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. All these idle false gods, they're doing nothing for you. God is a God who acts. He is the one who has the ability to act in the course 
of human history. Part of the theme of judgment is judgment is, is the theme of we have a God who will act. And I know judgment isn't a very popular word in our culture in the U.S. In fact, I think one of the most well-known and often quoted out of context verses in the Bible is when Jesus said, judge not. Now, usually they haven't read the rest of that. Maybe some of you are like, I keep my hands low. I've, I've used that one. Don't judge me, bro. Jesus said that. Don't judge me. You see, it's ripped out of context to say that we, like, we can't call what God clearly calls sin, sin. Where Jesus says, judge not in the context of the intent and the character of someone's heart and what God's going to do in their heart and lives. We're called to speak truth. We're called to speak truth. Now, Jesus spoke truth. That's why they tried to kill him multiple times. Jesus confronted sin. He always did it in a way that was full of grace. Grace and truth. He, he had the knack of doing that together perfectly. Go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. Oh, so you don't have a husband. Yeah, you've had four. The current one you're living with, not your husband. Truth and grace. And he does a really good job at doing that. And we don't always do such a good job of speaking the truth with grace and love. But let me tell you, at Life Community Church, this is a church, we are a church that are committed to speaking the truth. Yes, the truth with love and grace. But truth. We live in a culture that doesn't really know what truth is. Have you noticed that? Whatever Everybody says that your truth. I mean, just even the terms we use. Speak your truth. I speak my truth. That just denies that there's an ultimate source of truth and someone who created everything that says this is what truth is. We live in a, in a culture that doesn't even understand when it comes to um, humanity being made in the image of God, male and female, um, the truth and acknowledge the truth of what basic biology is. We're called to speak truth with love, with grace, truth. We live in a culture that tells you, what, do what you want. It's your body. Do what you want with your body. If it feels good, just do it. We live in a culture that's, uh, that does not value the sanctity of human life and the unborn. Truth. Jesus spoke truth. See, and the message of judgment is there comes a time that God comes in and, and God says, I'm going to act. And the concept of judgment is hard for us. But let me tell you, it's not quite so hard if you're living in a village in Myanmar where you're being bombed by a government with communist ties and roots that are trying to annihilate your people, all of a sudden, the concept of someone, a just authority coming in to set things to right, that's not so hard, is it? See, in ancient times, they wouldn't have a judge in a town, and when the judge would come to town, finally you had someone to plead your case to. There's a beauty in God coming in and saying, I'll set things to right. I'll call the balls and strikes. I will act decisively. Also, we see, we, we, we see in these passage, God says, I'm going to judge you for idolatry. I warned you about this hundreds of years ago for immorality. In fact, he compares them to Sodom and, Gomor and Gomorrah. It's not a compliment. He compares the leaders. Uh, he, says, he says, hey, see how the faithful cities become a prostitute. They've abandoned me and gone after all these idols. Also, he's, gonna, he's going to pronounce judgment because of their hypocrisy. Check this out. And let me just say, some of you, um, you've struggled. Perhaps you've had conversations or you've struggled because you're like, man, the church is so full of hypocrites. We're going to get to the good news in a minute. But it's true. There's a lot of hypocrisy even today, isn't there? Here's what, he does. Here's what God says about this in verse 11. He says, the multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, convocations. I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. This was all of their um, 
church, they're gatherings essentially, religious gatherings. He says, I cannot bear it. Your new moon feasts, your appointed festivals, I hate with all my being. Remember, God had told them to do this. this these were good things God had told them to, to do. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Whew. God's got something to say about that, right? See, and here's the thing. He's writing to people that are checking off some of the religious boxes, you know, the festivals and sort of the minutia and keeping things dialed in, checking off religious boxes, but they've neglected uh, what was at the very heart of the law. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You be faithful to God, and then that's your love for God is worked out in the way you treat each other. Love your neighbors as yourself. We talked about that a few weeks ago as we uh, talked about everyday disciple. If you missed our last five weeks, go back and listen. It's so critical in the life of our church, okay? So this is your home church. Go back and catch up on that. But so God says hypocrisy, and he uses this, this shocking illustration of hands lifted in prayer, which is how Jews would pray. We still worship and lift our hands to the Lord, palms up, dripping with blood, I, this was poignant illustration for me because uh, this week I was on a hunt with a friend and we ended up being able to fill his tag and uh, skinning, you know, an elk. And uh, you definitely want to wash up after that, right? And he's lifting this example of their, their um, hands being lifted up with the blood of the innocent people, children, people they've shed. You're checking off religious boxes. Meanwhile, your heart is far away from me. Your heart is far away from me. Remember, Jesus tells the religious leaders kind of the same thing, doesn't he? Jesus, when he comes, he says, uh, go read your Bibles to the people that have the Bible memorized by heart. It drove them crazy. He said, go le learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Go back, read the prophet Isaiah. You're checking off boxes, but your heart's far away. The people I've come to save and redeem are the people you want nothing to do with. You treat others very poorly. Meanwhile, you know, you're being really careful about tithing, you know, your mint and these little herbs from the garden, the minutia, but you're neglecting the greater things from the law of mercy and compassion. He says, those aren't bad things. You should do that. I mean, that's good. You're just neglecting the important stuff. And see, it's so easy um, to walk through the doors and maybe check off a set of boxes in, in, your, in your mind of things that make you feel good. You know, think you're tipping the scales in favor. Okay, I think God's happy with me. You know, I've tended a certain amount or given a certain amount. It's possible to do that and still have a heart that's very far from God. No affection towards God. No love for God mistreating others in life. And God says, I hate that. In fact, here's what he says. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Like Jesus says, hey, you know that's good stuff. Do that. But, but go and do the bigger things, the more important things, the weightier things. This is the way we live our lives, a life that understands what God did for us and it overflows in the way we treat others. This is the way a life walked in the Holy Spirit by his power works itself out in our life. In grateful response to what we're going to talk about in just a second, redemption. This is what I love about the work of outpour. Because um, there's, this, there's this two hands of the gospel. We go and we proclaim the gospel, but we also work in, in compassion. We bring the love of Jesus to those that are in desperate situations, to those women in risk of being trafficked, those babies in risk of being trafficked. We rescue the weak and the poor. This is stuff all throughout the Hebrew scriptures, all throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament, close to the heart of God, right on his heart. 
And I love that. You know, a couple weeks ago, I shared that quote with you um, from the, this discipleship guy um, that said, your talk talks, you know, when we share about Jesus, your talk talks, and your walk, the way you live your life, your walk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Did you catch that? One more time. Your talk talks and your walk talks but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. And God here, he says, I, I, I can't take the hypocrisy. And there's going to be judgment against it. But, but what I love about the, uh, the prophet Isaiah is it doesn't stop there. It's not all doom and gloom. In fact, it's one of the most beautiful books about the hope of redemption. Redemption. Here's what he says in verse 18. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord, though your sins are are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. There's coming a time when I'm going to forgive, when your sins are going to be washed away. And how's that going to come? Verse 27, Zion will be delivered with justice, her penitent ones with what? Righteousness. Righteousness. But rebels and sinners will both be broken, and those who forsake the Lord will perish. Righteousness. And what's interesting is in Isaiah 53, one of the most clear prophecies, 700 years before Jesus, one of the most clear of the 300-some prophecies that Jesus fulfilled in his first advent. Isaiah 53, I think, tops them all. And here's what it says in verse 11. After he, speaking of Jesus, the righteous servant of God, the messianic figure that everyone knew was referring to the Messiah, even though they couldn't figure out how this all worked together because he was a suffering servant. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. Gang, this is a prophecy of the resurrection 700 years before it happened. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. Where does it come? Where does righteousness come from? From Jesus, the righteous servant. And he will bear their iniquities. See, the message of Isaiah through and through is a message of, how, of redemption. And how is it accomplished? By the act of God. God coming in the flesh to take on the sins, to bear the sins of the world. In fact, back in Isaiah 6, when he receives this commission, he's in the throne room of God in this, in this prophetic vision. And what does he say? This is the prophet. This is the righteous prophet of God. And what does he understand? Woe to me, for I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And then the angel, the seraphim, takes the coal and touches it to his lips and it cleanses him. See, he understood what Paul understood really well. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's not acts of religious acts that tip the scale in the favor. All of us fall short of the glory of God. Paul even goes as far as saying, um, <laughs> there's no one righteous, no, not one. That's what Isaiah understood. Even though I've lived my life for God, I fall short of his glory. It takes God acting to bring redemption. It takes him acting, and that's what Jesus did at the giving of the new covenant, where he poured out his blood for us, for the forgiveness of all sins. What you cannot accomplish for yourself, he accomplishes. And that's at the heart of the book of Isaiah. That's why Paul says, he has this recognition, I am the worst of sinners. I was literally persecuting the church. He says this, even though I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy. It's the mercy of God. It's the action of God. And the heart of, the heart of redemption is this. It's the heart of the Father God towards the people of the nations of the earth to redeem them. Oh, to redeem people. There is... No one outside of the reach of God. And as followers of Jesus, our heart should be praying for people that they would experience the redemption of God. Even evil, awful religious leaders that are, that are encouraging and standing up for some of these 
awful acts, you know, that were perpetrated in Israel or different things. Our hearts should be, God, you could redeem them. You could win them to you. You could draw them to you, Lord. The, the commanders, those involved in government leadership in Myanmar that are, you know, directly or indirectly involved in some of this genocide. God, you could win their hearts. You could redeem them. I remember uh, when uh, we went in to Myanmar the first time back in 08 with, uh, with Ray, we, uh, we got into Myanmar, which is crazy. Um, and we had this, this guide with us, tour guide, who we later found out was a spy. And what's been so cool over the past years is Ray um, went back and he developed a relationship with this guy. And he's had the chance to influence him toward Jesus and form a relationship um, with, his, uh, with one of his children and actually help this child get into, get into college and some really cool stuff. Planting the seeds of the gospel. Why? Because no one's outside of the reach of God. He wants to draw people toward himself. That's the heart of our God. No one is further than the grace, the free gift of God can reach them. His grace is more powerful than all that. His redemption brings hope, and we see it all over Isaiah. Judgment, but that's not the end of the story. Redemption, and redemption brings hope for the future. See, Isaiah writes about his time and a couple generations from now. And exactly what he wrote happened. The people are hauled off to, to exile. But he also writes of the hope of, an, of a return 70 years later. And he actually names by name the, the ruler that will decree the people come back. And a remnant comes back to the land, which is the line and the seed of the Messiah. And then he says the Messiah is going to come. And 700 years later, it happens just like he wrote. And he also talks about hope for a new day. Hope for eternity, hope for a new kingdom where sickness and pain and death will be destroyed. His vision stretches from mountaintop to mountaintop. And here is the hope that is in store for you if, you've, if you have received the redemption offered by Jesus. He says this, see, very end of the book, see, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together and the lion will eat straw like the ox and the dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountains, says the Lord. This beautiful picture of a new heavens, a new earth with peace, where conflict is done away with, where pain and sickness is done away with. And here, here's the beautiful thing. Because the prophesied judgment of God, God prophesied it just as he promised, and it happened exactly as Isaiah prophesied. That in the midst of judgment... You can hang your hat on the hope that Isaiah prophesies because God promises that. And even though it's not here yet, even though we live in this time in this valley between the first advent and the second when he returns, we have a hope. And because Jesus fulfilled and God fulfilled his promises over and over and over again, you can better believe he's going to fulfill his promises to come again. God is a God who acts in the course of history. One of our famous Christian creeds says he is returning to judge the quick and the dead. The quick, you're like, I'm not very fast. You're faster than the dead. <laughs> what that means is the living those still alive when he returns, and those, there will be a day we stand in front of our Savior, every one of us. The question is, what would you do with the free offer of redemption? The free gift of grace offered to you, freely offered, freely received. We are all in need of redemption, and even in great darkness and turmoil, there is great, 
great hope. Would you bow your heads? As we close, I'm going to pray. And when I pray, don't get up right away because we're going to have some instructions about the chili thing. If there's someone in the room that you, you want to receive that free gift of redemption that Jesus offers, why don't you pray a prayer like this with me? Lord Jesus, I need you. I need your forgiveness and grace. Lord, I believe you're who you said you are, the son of God, that you died and rose again, that you paid the price for my sin. And I embrace what you did for me fully. I ask you for forgiveness and life in you. I want to spend eternity with you. Help me live my life by your Holy Spirit and follow you all the days of my life. I turn away from that old life. I want to follow you. And Lord, thank you for all the rest that have already prayed that, that perhaps are struggling with hope right now. Lord, the fact that you, that you predicted so many things that came off just as you predicted them hundreds of years in advance tells us you will keep your word. And we look forward to you coming again, Jesus. We say, even so, come Lord Jesus. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.